What's up, Foot Clan? Before we get today's show started, want to remind you about a sweet giveaway we got going on over at FootClanGiveaway.com. He signed Devontae Adams jersey and some fantasy footballer swag. You can enter for free. Just head to FootClanGiveaway.com. Welcome to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast with your host, Andy Holloway. Jason Moore and Mike Wright. Oh, welcome in. Another day in the neighborhood. Mm. The footballer's neighborhood. Won't you be our neighbor? Thursday, June 25th, 2020. Jason just wanted to feel included. <laughs> Said the only Mr. Rogers quote he knew. Yeah. Welcome into the show. Great you're, one you for are, you today. Uh, you're, you're a real Mr. McFeely. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 mean, I don't. I accept. That's fine. Is, isn't all, he the postman? Yeah. I, I feel like if you're called anybody from that show, it's a compliment. I only know it from the Bloodhound Gang song. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I didn't Mr. I didn't McFeely? actually watch Rogers, yeah. You both had cable, so you probably didn't watch <laughs> a lot of Mr. Rogers. That is... Correct. I did not have cable. I watched a lot of Mr. Rogers. I've heard great things. That's why I have such a loving countenance, Mike. Just such a kind. Oh. That's why I'm such a kind soul. So oh, you, you were raised on that, and we were raised on like turtles and, yeah. and things like that, and that's why we have our issues. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if it was turtles. It was more like what a lot did of you have? Nickelodeon slime Rug rat, in, Rugrats and Nick Slime life. and... Uh, eventually, you had what Beavis and Butthead and things of that well, nature. Well, the, the parents don't we know never about watched that. those. Yes, right. certainly. I don't watch Ren and Stimpy. <laughs> That's the one I was thinking of. Yeah, yeah and so you know, the, I have ADHD. So yeah. <laughs> uh, well, let's digress. Uh, we have a great show for you today. Got a, a buy sale question that I'm excited to talk about. Excited to remind you about the Ultimate Draft Kit, UltimateDraftKit.com. If you want to get access to that right now. Got some new articles up on the website, thefantasyfootballers.com, including a fantasy court article, the case for and against Calvin Ridley. Ooh. And uh, trying to decide. I mean, I, I softened my prediction on Calvin Ridley a little bit this year. I softened my, my stats. Okay. But part of that has to do with the buy-sell we're going to get into in a minute. You can find us on Twitter at the FF Ballers. Find us on Instagram. Instagram.com slash fantasy footballers. Let's, let's do some buy sell. Buy or sell presented by Pristine Auction. Buy or sell Mark Andrews 1,000 receiving yards in 2020, the upcoming year. Last year, he played in 15 games. Targeted 98 times, 64 receptions, 852 yards receiving. It's not bad. 10 touchdowns. Will he hit the 1,000-yard mark? Over the past five years, it's happened 14 times at the tight end position. But they have uh, required an average of 126 targets. What do you think? That's a lot of targets for Andrews to get. I don't know that he will need that many. That's obviously the average. He's a big play uh, type of guy. But I have him right now projected in the Ultimate Draft Kit for 1,011 oh my. yards. So really? I do have him with the over. And let me read you some numbers. Okay, these are snap counts from the second half of the year. 34%, 50%, 36%, 40%, 43%, 15%, 37%. They should okay. put him on the field more. Well, hold on. Who was that? Let me read you some more snap counts. This is a different player, same game period. 57%, 42%, 44%, 35%, 47%, 29%, 55%. Oh. So which one this of those is a was a Hayden Hurst and Mark Andrews c contest? It is. It's basically who was on the field more between those two? Pretty much near equal. And one of those guys is now gone. I think that with Hayden Hurst leaving, Mark Andrews' snaps have to go up. I do, do have they? I, maybe not the snaps, but the tight end target percentage could go up. Last year, he was at fifty four percent of the tight end target percentage. Nick Boyle had 
twenty four percent last year, and Hurst had the other whatever percent is left. <laughs> and it could it could go up, but Andrews to me is not a volume guy because this is not a volume passing offense. He is a touchdown guy. I have him at nine hundred yards in sixteen games, so I am a sell. I have him projected right around the nine hundred mark as well. I'm I'm a sell for the thousand yards. He's still going to be great for fantasy purposes, but I. I, I am not doing that that uh, algebra. I'm not f- doing that equation of that. Hayden Hurst is gone. It means that uh, Mark Andrews snaps are just going to rise. I think it's uh, they'll just use other guys in, in instead of Hayden Hurst. Yeah, I mean the connection that Mark Andrews clearly has with Lamar Jackson is special, and you know this was only his. You got to you got to keep in mind. We talk about this all the time for fantasy. Tight ends take years to break sure. out. That was only his second year in the league, Mark Andrews. He was also dealing with some injury. I think that there's no, there is not one ounce, not a shred of doubt in my mind that they want Mark Andrews on the field more if they can, if he's healthy and he can be out there. And if he is, you know, I've got him for a uh, hundred and seventeen targets leading. Well, here, here's a counterpoint, though. You are a big Hollywood Brown fan. Yes. Mm -hmm. Hollywood Brown was also very injured, banged up, limited snap counts, limited targets. You're projecting a big year for him. I don't know if both of those guys can go, you know, Hayden Hurst's absence was 30 receptions on the year. Right. But I I mean, the wide receiver one and the tight end one are not going to eat into each other's snap counts. If they're out there in 12 personnel or 11 personnel, they're both on the field. So I'm not I'm not worried at all. Not snap counts, but you're you're projecting obviously not just a snap increase. You're projecting a production increase for him to go over a thousand yards. I have and a production increase for Hollywood. Correct. I have Andrews with 117 targets, Marquise Brown with 108 targets, both an increase. And last year, year. Hollywood was yeah 71. Andrews was 98. I'm not saying Andrews can't do it. I mean, he certainly could. There have been rumors, though. A couple of teams that Antonio Brown... Oh, that changes everything. ...could end up on. Ravens are included in that in that discussion. What do we think about the Antonio Brown rumors? How would you react if he landed in Baltimore? Hmm. Does he... I mean, I assume he would be drafted ahead of Hollywood. Instantly. Yes, yeah. I would take him ahead I of I think you would have to. Um, man, I... I haven't really done the, the the thought exercise of putting Antonio on the, that's a, the that's Ravens. That's not a healthy exercise, <laughs> genuinely. <laughs> yeah, you want him going somewhere else where he can step in as the, the you know. But the where where is well, that? You know all all the rumored teams are like devastating for for fantasy hopes and dreams of breakout players. Well, he would ironic. still be facing a, a suspension too, right? He possibly he could. Yeah, the NFL has not announced whether it would or not. But um, you know, one of the other destinations because of the Debo injury has been the San Francisco 49ers, where he comes in and has the chance to be the number one target. But really, George Kittle is you know, yeah, right. is, is the number one target. It's very similar here where Mark Andrews could still end up hurting uh, on a, both teams' low-passing volume offense. But, yep, uh, Baltimore last in team pass play percentage whew, in the NFL. Yeah, I mean, that's that's not that's not great. But at the same time, when you are last because your run game is so good, your passing game is hyper- efficient and that's that's what we saw last year that's why it's hard their to quarterback was the mvp of the it's league it's hard to repeat, hard to repeat, that, repeat that kind of efficiency i wonder if you'll end up maybe right on some of the yardage numbers of those two players but some of those touchdown totals might diminish just because of the natural regression that happens after a mvp year yeah i mean i i have i, I think one of the big differences here i have lamar jackson throwing 65 more passes this season so it, I expect his passing volume to go up as his rushing totals come down a little bit and that equates to more value for Mark Andrews are they your Super Bowl pick Jason they are I don't have a Super Bowl pick yet but uh TBD gotta have a Super Bowl first <laughs> yes that's a fact all right anything else you want to add in there Mike no okay that was by yourself from pristine auction pristineauction.com uh yeah pristine auction Great place, sports memorabilia. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't want to cut you off there. Use the code BALLERS, and you're going to get a $10 credit if you register a new account there. We're at Pristine Auction all the time. My question was going to be, you talked about you are you nerfed your Calvin Ridley projection a little bit based off of this buy or sell. So yeah, that's where I'm trying thank you to for bringing figure that, up. that, that well, out. It, it, everything comes back to Hayden Hurst. You, you know that, right? In the world. Not the just, whole world. not even I, just look, fantasy. I know that Hayden Hurst is on the team. Yes, Hayden Hurst is one of the leaders statistically in um, uh, anticipated 
uh, effect. <laughs> the <laughs> theoretical numbers. No, I, I just had Hayden Hurst a little bit lower, and I moved Hayden Hurst up a little in my projections, and that came at the expense of a little bit of my Calvin Ridley projection. I had I had Ridley ahead of Allen Robinson, and I didn't like that. Yeah, I, and I don't like that either. So I made a small adjustment, and Hurst went up a little bit. Ridley came down just a little bit. And, uh, you know, Matt Ryan has talked up Hayden Hurst extensively. And it's not like we don't have, you know, we've got the Matt Ryan, Tony Gonzalez era. We've got the Matt Ryan, Austin Hooper era. There is a world yes. where Hayden Hurst is heavily involved in a volume standpoint. So I just think we've, we've had so much focus on Julio and Calvin Ridley this offseason. But Russell Gage and Hayden Hurst will be involved in this offense. Um, Jason will f- remind us of Todd Gurley's involvement in the passing game too. So that's right. It's just a little bit of a balancing act that you have to do in in projecting Atlanta. So that's how it came down to it. All right, I got you. Yeah, let's do some mailbag. 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 And now we'll oh. get my drink. Oh, you didn't have it in your mouth. Mike was taking a sip, and I oh, thought I caught him. You almost did. Oh, that would have been. I guess it would have ended the up tea all, had over, all touched, over me. It, it touched my lips. Oh, it's hot tea, and I rejected it. Oh, that wouldn't have I been. Said back into the cup, tea. It's, it's mailbag, mailbag time. time. <laughs> it's mailbag time. <laughs> all right. If you have a question for the show, there are many ways to get it to us. You can visit the website, thefantasyfootballers.com. dot com. Click the submit a question button. You can dial our voicemail hotline three zero two four six four TFFB. We also pull questions from YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Lots of questions out there. We've got answers. Sometimes. It's like Mr. Rogers had answers for me. Not for you guys. I mean, No, no. Ren and Stimpy had answers for you. They did. Yeah, it's usually that, farting. Yeah. <laughs> you don't want to pee on the electric fence. That's, that's what I true. learned. That's true. But that, that's a really good life lesson. For that's sure a good fantasy is. football tip, too. Yeah. Don't whiz on, on the electric, electric fence. fence. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> I like it. It's it's but it's a true fact. I yeah. don't like it. <laughs> um, <laughs> Instagram question: Miles Sanders or J.K. Dobbins and Mark Ingram in oh. a dynasty league? So if you're in a dynasty, would you rather have the oh combo my. the combo platter in Baltimore of Dobbins and Ingram or just Miles Sanders? That's a great question. It is a great question. I'm going to go with the Baltimore Raven backfield. Interesting. I lean that I would go Miles Sanders. Now it's this is tough uh, because Mark we we like Mark Ingram. We talked recently about how he's just he is now a value in the ultimate is, draft kit. He is a value because he's a value in drafts right That's now. That's why. Yeah. Good. <laughs> yeah, good that's reason. Good, that's great reason. I just wanted to explain the process. Sure. We saw him as a value. Yeah. So we put him in as a value. As a value. <laughs> Ingram, Ingram, I like him for fantasy this year, and I really like uh, J.K. Dobbins moving forward. I like the he he projects well in everything that I like about an NFL running back, but that's projecting. That like right, you don't know projections go haywire sometimes, and for things that you can't even calculate. Miles Sanders though feels like a proven running back in the NFL. He's he's already come through for fantasy purposes. He is he. Has three down ability that remains to be seen whether or not the the chicken or egg situation with Doug Peterson of the running back by committee is that he's been forced to do it, just never had the player. Well, he's got a player now in Miles Sanders who could be a three down guy. So the the ceiling for Miles Sanders, I believe, is higher. You know, the, uh, let me paint the other two. Guys. Let me paint the ugly picture for the Baltimore scenario. Here, okay. Here's the ugly picture. You take the Baltimore side of the trade. You start Mark Ingram this year. Mark Ingram performs worse than Miles Sanders on the totality of the year. Right. Mm-hmm. Next year, they they bring Ingram back, and they split the load. Right. And you don't know who to start week to week, and you could have had multiple years of Miles Sanders giving you yeah. much better production. Uh, but I think the path will be slightly – I think it'll end up clearer than that. I think it'll be Ingram this year, Dobbins next year. I'm going to – it's close, but I'm going to go that way. Yeah, it's it's very close. And I think that what this might come down to is a little bit of looking at your roster and saying, do I need a, the, the bigger punch? I think that's Miles Sanders or the better depth. Because obviously one advantage of having Ingram and Dobbins is a little bit of injury mitigation. Either right. guy gets injured, you've got the other one who will take a step up in fantasy. But if you're starting one guy and you, you don't 
you know, you and you've got depth. I would take the Miles Sanders trade in general. In a vacuum, I think I would rather have Miles Sanders. And you do have an extra roster spot with the Miles Sanders side. Right. So all right, let's hit a voicemail question. Hey Ballers, Brooks and Owl. It's Colleen. Wondering where you're comfortable taking Dalvin Cook in a full point PPR draft this year. Also keep trade cut pizza wings tacos. Oh Love the show. Thanks. Oh, well, let's oh, start oh. with the important question. Yes. yes. Uh, the, well, the the important thing we need to start with is uh, never speak to Judge Giamatti and Al Borland, please. <laughs> Thank you. Like, Thank why did we have mate. to reference them? Oh my goodness! And it did make who, me uncomfortable. Yeah, it made me very <laughs> uncomfortable. And guess who picks these and and vets these questions? Oh, I wonder who that could be. Oh goodness. <laughs> I'll be sure to beep out any future mentions. <laughs> there there right. it goes. Yes, Please leave it in. Sir. Don't don't cut it early. Just bleep it out. I love that. That is a that is a prime solution. <laughs> he who uh, shall not be named. Um. Okay. So pizza, tacos, wings. Keep trade cut. Oh man. Uh, I'm uh, keeping pizza. Man, I think I so, have to cut wings, which I love. I'll well, trade wings. Here's uh, I have an admission for for the world. I. Over like the the past couple months, like, oh, I feel like this is a big moment. <laughs> I it, like pizza used to be a, up the top of all. Oh it's, no, it's Brooks, the top of power your rankings. Ears. Yeah, Brooks, you don't mean not want to hear this. I think I can live in a world without pizza. <gasps> like it's just I I know that it's shocking for some. It's not shocking for others. Twenty twenty continues to bring but, us <laughs> bombshell announcement after I, bombshell announcement. I mean, people live in prison right that's <laughs> th that's the world like, you're painting without pizza like we, we do a, a pizza movie night in the right household every friday and i find myself more and more like i'm gonna order a sandwich with the pizza because I, I don't i don't know like so wow. you're just not processing pizza the way you used to no that's certainly a factor <laughs> <laughs> all right i'm keeping pizza i'm trading tacos i'm cutting wings final answer it's funny because all of these you can get from so many different places right and right. what is the most consistent? Like tacos, I feel like that would be the least consistent of what I'm going to get from a random establishment. I feel like wings. Pizza yeah, I would say wings. Uh, oh, the, is that worse? Wings are all over the place. You can get some nasty wings. Again, I'm keeping tacos. I feel like the worse the wing is, the more of the default buffalo sauce gets smothered on it. Like, yep. The more that is true. it's covered in it, yes. the worse the meat is. It's like when you the, the smelly poop and then you spray the perfume and it mm. just doesn't actually work. Okay. It doesn't make it's the wing just, better. It's just like that. Yeah. Uh, you try and cover it up. I see it clear uh, now. Where do you draft Alvin Cook? Where would you be comfortable? We've had this discussion a couple of weeks ago. I think Mike and I would both jump on him in the back of the first round. That is correct. So Jason, I think, was a little bit cooler. I, I'm a little bit cooler on, on him just because of the risk, but it's still near there. It's back of the back of the first, top of the second. It, here's it's basically a matter of who is gone. I would I would take Kenyon Drake ahead of Dalvin Cook right now, just to mitigate that risk. Okay, but I think that's where I break. Um, you know, I'm not taking Aaron Jones or Joe Mixon or those guys over Dalvin Cook. So that's kind of that's kind of how I see it. Where wherever that falls at the end of the first, back uh, back of the first, end of this, back of the first, <laughs> beginning of the second, somewhere in that range. Uh, all right. Um, Facebook question from John. Does the coronavirus increase the value of handcuffs in redraft leagues? Sure. Uh, that wasn't your answer. That was you acknowledging the question. That was me acknowledging okay. the question. And uh, not a doctor, but <laughs> I, I don't know, man. I, I think <laughs> I, I think so. This is this is a question that's <laughs> really just know. a it's a philosophical <laughs> question about whether or not you are building for better depth. You know. Our normal strategy is we we draft a strong starting lineup, and then we're swinging for the fences with all of our later picks. Right. We're trying to get guys who could blow up in week one and be something, or we could cut them and move on. But I do think that there is a world where you might want, you know, you, you talked earlier about a uh, last episode, a sleeper in Randall Cobb, right? Mm -hmm. He is not, his ceiling is nothing special. But I, he's, I can agree with that. He's yeah. paid a lot of money to be an integral part of a, of a team. And if you need to start him, you're going to be okay. Maybe that's a better piece to pick because if a starter, and this isn't just handcuffs for running backs, I mean, all players are, you know, susceptible to viruses. So um, I think it's just a matter of you might want to build a little bit more depth into your teams than just going for upside.
I mean, I, I think the argument against handcuffing a player has always been you might just be able to have a contributing depth piece that is always valuable as opposed to waiting for an injury. There's also an argument in the, you know, again, doesn't need to be stressed. We're not doctors. We don't know how this will affect the NFL or whether it will affect it a lot or a little. I will say this. A handcuff place for the same team is the potential starter that could be sick. Sure. And, and having a depth piece, you know, on a different team might not be so bad either if that's your decision-making yeah. process. I mean, no, that's fair. Uh, you know, if, if a, if a frontline starter goes down and you have Alexander Madison, is that going to be better for you than, you know, a Devin Singletary or a, or right. a and, and the thing, Jordan Howard? I don't know. The other aspect of when you're in the draft and you're like, oh, I got the handcuff. The joke could be on you, and you don't actually have mm -hmm. the handcuff. Like that happens very frequently. There are a few guys we know for sure, like Madison Pollard, uh, and I guess like I think Chase Edmonds is and there. Chase Edmonds. Yeah, there, there are a few players that uh, you would say that there's a very high probability if the starter in front of them is they the get the time, majority, they're going to get a huge workload. But a lot of the times we you you get real excited about a backup running back, and then it's just Three player time share and you and no one's really bringing any fantasy value. It it seems like a tough gamble to take on one or two of your players needing to be handcuffed in case they're the ones that get sick. You might be better off, you know, if you're gonna have to be super nimble and flexible this year in trading players, you're not you there's no value to that handcuff except to you. But right. there's value to a depth piece. If you've got Jordan Howard on your bench and someone else needs a running back. He's valuable as opposed to you trying to be the Dalvin Cook owner trading Alexander Madison away. You're not going to get value for that. Right. This is going to be an insane. This is going insane to be insane fantasy it, season. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I I think we'll need our you know thoughtful strategy more than ever. I would love to not have to do. That. <laughs> yeah, but I'm glad that you're yeah. excited for the challenge, and we're up for it. We're yeah. we're going to be with you, and we're going to be helping, and we're going to be along for that. Wild ride, and I can promise you Oof. one thing: I have no idea what's going to happen. Yes, none. All right, let's let's grab another voicemail. Hey, ballers! This is Abe in Detroit, Michigan. Bonjour. <laughs> I'd like to know if there are any players outside of Le'Veon Bell on the New York Jets that have any fantasy relevance for the 2020 season. Thanks a lot, guys. River Dirty. Okay. River Dirty. You threw us for a loop there a couple is times. This some, Greetings, by the way. Yeah. Was that some Brad Pitt? Uh, I don't know. Never mind. We, we don't know. He said uh, it before. <clears throat> uh, I will say this. Yes. I think there is. Chris Herndon. Yeah. Has a chance to be relevant. Jamison Crowder, PPR much like leaks. Randall Cobb, has. I, like, I'd rather have Crowder than Cobb. And I don't blame you. Like, Crowder I think he was. Has value. Crowder was one, uh, a name I considered for the sleeper show, but like I felt like Cobb was yeah just much and more Denzel submerged. Mims, Denzel Mims has a chance to be a contributing rookie wide receiver. I'm not gonna bet my house on it. I mean, are you so the, the hard part for Mims is they did bring in Brashad Perriman, who yes, I, Perriman had a little bit of a little bit of that Devonte Parker breakout where you've been waiting and waiting and waiting for a first rounder. It took. Uh, everybody to be injured in front of him for him to get the shot, but he came through for Tampa Bay last he, year. Yeah, I, I guess I'll just settle on Herndon and Crowder. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I wouldn't I, put Mims there, but I the 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 name that is curious to talk about is Sam Darnold. You know, he, he's going to be a streamable option, and we've talked a lot about Daniel Jones and these other guys. Maybe they'll come through. I mean, this is his third year in the league, and he was sick last year, missing games. With the kissing disease, I mean, sure. Sam Darnold. Much better offensive line situation absolutely. should help him. What's wild? I'm looking through. He's not near the top of my yeah. my rankings. I'm looking at Crowder's consistency last year, and it's wild because it is. It's not all over the place. It's literally he was either very good for your team, he was a top twenty guy, or he was in like the sixties. So I, I think Crowder is interesting. Crowder is definitely interesting because that was last year with Robbie Anderson on the team as the perceived number one uh, wide receiver on the team, but at least outwardly that may, may not have been that inside the locker room. But Crowder, is, Crowder has he has value, especially yes. PPR value. All right, Patrick B has a question for us from Twitter. I see that rookie Jonathan Taylor is ranked from twenty six to twenty eight in the UDK, depending on your format. 
With the Colts' offensive line, I feel like he could be a top 10 running back this year. What are your thoughts on Jonathan Taylor? You're, you are not incorrect, Patrick. He certainly could be a top 10 player, but... Not uh, every running back you could say that about. So that's, right, that's but, high praise. But I agree. Jonathan, Jonathan Taylor could be a top 10 guy. I think he will be a top 10 guy in the future. But I'm not projecting Marlon Mack to just disappear. I think he's going to be involved. Jay Naeem Wright, Hines will be heavily involved it, as well. That's of course. three running backs to work into a rotation. That makes it hard to finish in the top 10. Yeah, it's it's all about how the the workload split is between mm -hmm. those three backs. I am currently for my ultimate draft kit projections believing the coach speak of Marlon Mack and Jonathan Taylor being that one one punch and Naeem Hines being a little bit involved. I do however think that the you know it's it's realistic. To, uh, Jonathan Taylor is another world better than Marlon Mack and that's that, that's coming from someone who so thinks Marlon Mack. So that's very high praise from you. Yeah, I, I think Marlon Mack is a is a is a good running back in the NFL. Jonathan Taylor is a different specimen as a human. He is in that Saquon Barkley type of athlete, um, and so I do. I mean, if if Frank Reich, who I respect, just comes out and goes, you know what, this dude's built for a workload. Obviously, he did it in college. He's better on the field than our other guys. Let's get him out there more. That could happen, and if that happens, his upside is tremendous. Rookie yeah. year is awesome. I just I'm projecting it to be split. Yeah, and it was uh, late May that Frank Wright came out and said that Naeem Hines could end up with ten catches, you know, in a game here or there. It, it will be less predictable now than probably at any stage in Jonathan Taylor's career. But I think we all see the upside. And the opportunity in the offensive line is great. Yeah, and I, I don't blame people for drafting him because of that upside. There's probably too large of a gap in the Clyde Edwards, Alaire, Jonathan Taylor range of outcome situation. Like where Clyde Edwards, Alaire is being drafted much higher. Yeah. And he's, dra he's, he's being drafted as the starting running back. Yeah, right and he's now. still going to have to potentially deal with some of the things that we're talking about in. Indianapolis mm -hmm. with Damian Williams and others. So probably too big of a gap. Both could end up having a great year. Both could be kind of painful to own for six, seven, eight weeks of the season where you're like, man, I thought I was going to start this guy. I so desperately want some shares of Jonathan Taylor this year because I believe in him so much from college. I just don't know if I can pay up yeah. for what I'm expecting the beginning of the season to look like. Yeah, fair enough. All right, Facebook question from Alex. I haven't heard a lot of talk about T.Y. Hilton. When would y'all draft him? When is he considered a value? Uh, I believe he is in our values in the ultimate draft kit. Yeah, he. it was interesting because we, we had our uh, early off-season discussions where I think the three of us were very in on T.Y. Hilton, if I remember it correctly. I could speak for myself. I was like, I think T.Y. Hilton is probably going to end up a top 10 wide receiver once I do my stat projections and I think that's where the cooling happened is we we all did our projections for the for the UDK and T.Y. Hilton ended up uh, lower than I thought he was going to be right like right now I have him at wide receiver 19 which is still tremendous that's the top 20 wide receiver I would very much like to have him on my fantasy team like do you guys have He's being drafted. ADP numbers right now? Yeah, I do. He, he's being drafted at 27 at the wide receiver position. Oh, that's. I have him at 17, which is why he's. I mean, those two, you know, are the gap in number there is why he's in the value. That's, yeah, that's a great value. Yeah, I, 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 I do feel very similar to, to you, Mike. I remember uh, Andy being so thrilled with how high I had T.Y. Hilton in our early rankings when it was just looking at players and sorting them around. Where do you have him? I, I have him at 29. I oh, don't. boo! Look, boo. I, that's that's how the stats lie. I've got him with 120 targets, 70 receptions, uh, over a thousand yards, and six touchdowns. So it's it's good, not great. And Give me some surprising names in front of him. Like you well, read, appara your, apparently Stephon Diggs will be one of those names. Stephon Diggs is ahead of him in my rankings. That's gross. I look this, that, is, bro. That's, that's gross, that I, bro. That's gross. <laughs> okay, no, but like look. At the names and see if there's here's any that surprise you, and then talk through. You're like, yes, yeah, I would actually draft them in front of Hilton. Three players that are ahead of them that uh, in my rankings how they fell, and I'll say whether or not I would actually draft them ahead of them. Jarvis Landry is one. 
I would probably rather go for the ceiling of Hilton over Jarvis Landry. Hilton could be a clear one, and Landry has a floor that could happen if Odell Beckham steps up. Michael Gallup, I have ahead of him. I would draft Michael Gallup ahead of T.Y. Hilton. I don't mind that. People, um, I would not draft Gallup ahead of T.Y. Hilton. Yeah, I mean, you're drafting a, a known two yeah, versus I mean, a known one, and I, I get that. But Hilton's fin fantasy finishes, I just want to illustrate it, some with Andrew Luck, some without, one with injury, but... In games that in seasons where he's played fourteen or more games, which has been all of them except for this past year, twenty fourth, nineteenth, eleventh, twenty first, fifth, twenty fifth, fourteenth. So he's never been outside the top twenty five in his career when he's played fourteen or more games. Yeah, he's he, but he's a quintessential. It's funny because we look at him with some of those big Andrew Luck years as this. You know, he had that year where he was the number five wide receiver, and. For the most part of his career, he's been a wide receiver too. Like he's finished as a right. wide receiver too the majority of his career. So that's where I have him. Obviously, a new quarterback coming in, which is better. Well, than you have, have him as a three. You don't that, have him as a two. Yeah. Okay, that that's fair. But I I view him as a uh, as a wide receiver two right now for this okay. upcoming season. I think that's fair, and that's what we do as well with our ranking. Mm -hmm. I, so. just, I and I would draft him at twenty at the wide receiver twenty. Like I I don't. I don't feel that the need to play the ADP game, and I would much rather have him than a guy like Michael Gallup, though. Just in the way that I play fantasy, Michael Gallup could disappear from week to week. I think Hilton on the field is the one every single week. Yeah, and I mean Phil Rivers is. I still think Phil Rivers has it. Clearly, you've shortened his name. Mm -hmm. Well, he he had to rebrand. Oh, he's Phil now. He to me in he Indianapolis, he's Phil. <laughs> very much needed a rebrand based on last year. He's actually shortened it even more just now. He's now P River. Hmm. That's not great. He, no, like, you don't want to pee in the river. His, <laughs> his marketing team, they're still working on it, but that's where he is right now. Right now, P Rivers. Hmm. No, I, I, I shortened it to P River. Oh, he, I'm his marketing you're, team. You're, if you, you, have, didn't. you <laughs> have changed his last name as well. But that means he's P River. That's not a good nickname. No, he's P, the River. P River. That's a you great nickname. You want to go for a swim in the P River? I don't. And you know what? I think that's an appropriate nickname, if I'm being honest. <laughs> I thought I could get you on board. No, nope. you started. You were no, nope, I'm I'm off. Look, I've actually been cooling Jason on Phil Rivers like contesting as well. it, and then he's like, "No, no, that's actually perfect." The, the, <laughs> Thank I, you. I uh, poor I, Phil. Yeah, you got to. <laughs> oh hope. no, he's back to Phil. <laughs> you got to hope that this... I'm not going to say poor P River. No, I mean, come on, because that's his own fault if he's P River. <laughs> that's shame on the P River. Um, <laughs> not, not, not a lot of fish are living in P River. That's for sure. Philip Rivers, it's not good fishing, <laughs> or whatever we're calling him, is far better than Jacoby Brissett was yeah, last year. Yes. Yeah, and so that's the hope for Ty Hilton and some of these other <laughs> options. And the Colts landing spot was neck ni that nickname yes. is not going on his shirt. <laughs> no, no, it's not sticking unless he just stinks. He I comes if out he stinks, just, he's going to be. Well, you know what stinks? P River. P River stinks. You don't want to go down to the shore of P River. You don't go tubing on P River. No, 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 no. Um, yeah. So, uh, but I'm but lowering T.Y. Hilton now because right. of this whole conversation. The thing is, is his offensive line is obviously better than it was last year for the Chargers. <laughs> yeah, but his weapons, good. his weapons. I think are are worse. No, like, it's a fair point. I mean, it's it's a different identity of a team, and they don't have. I mean, no Keenan Allen, Mike Williams, Hunter Henry, Austin Eckler. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so it's close though. It's, it's not it's, that far. Yeah, it's 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 near it's near itself. But I think that uh, Philip Rivers looked like he lost a step last year. He keeps telling everybody, "Go watch the film." You, and I'm, every time he's like saying that, I'm like, "Don't you don't you look, don't want to see he's that?" He's never had a step, so to speak. I mean, he he's an efficient. What the problem was? You were losing painfully, Jason, and and the Chargers were losing painfully because of the checkdown, you know, situation. And or or remember a couple of the games he wouldn't check it down, kept throwing it down the field, couldn't come back and win games. There's a lot of peripheral pain with Philip Rivers and last season on on the Chargers, but he wasn't that bad of a quarterback. He wasn't. He threw 20 interceptions. Yeah, he did. Yeah, no, no. If, and he's had a like couple, he of, those, had a couple of those years where he's done that. Put that's, too much. That's on him. true. He he threw he threw twenty one interceptions in twenty sixteen. The following season came back with ten interceptions. So yeah. You, yeah. T that speaks to your point. And I think the offensive line changes things a lot for Pete River. <laughs> <laughs> All right, another voicemail question. 
Hey, Ballers. This is Paul from Chicago. Um, I was wondering, what is your guys' best advice for trying to make more trades with league mates who mm. either don't really send out trade offers very often or just aren't very active in terms of trading? Thanks, guys. Let me know. Keep up the great work. Yeah, it's a great question. And we get that one all the time. And it, and I love the heart of the question, which is, I want my league to be better. I want my league to have more activity. And that's what makes fantasy fun. That's what this show was built on was the idea that, look, you are, you know, there's only one winner at the end of the year. Hopefully it's you. For a lot of you, congratulations. For some of you, not so much. But the whole journey should be fun. The whole journey should be enjoyable. Having a league with three or four dead teams or no activity is not fun. So we come back to the communication piece Mm -hmm. where you want to get more trades done. You need to have the league being discussed in general in a centralized location all the time where people are smack talk. Yeah. uh, Breaking news happens and it, it, you know, somebody gets on and says, Oh, this looks really nice for my player and mocks everybody else. That's the community that kind of facilitates activity. I would also say make, stronger trade offers if you're trading with someone who doesn't usually trade don't do the strategy where you go well i think i'm going to end up here so i'm going to offer less so you know it's like it's It's, like it's called the major league baseball negotiating strategy right right. now with the mlbpa (laughs) exactly like you you put in an offer for a house in real estate and you're like i'm willing to go 15 more but i'm going to offer less and then end there don't do that with people that don't make trades offer them a trade that's really good from the get-go uh from their side where they go I like this because that's one I way. Like to, <laughs> I like it. I don't like it. It's it's tough because it's a you're you're changing the culture of your of your league, and it's it starts with the communication hub, but it's it won't happen overnight. It's gonna be tough. Yeah, and s- some of that might mean injecting some new blood into your league. Mm-hmm. You know, a couple of people that have never made a trade or die out halfway through the year. It's time to move on. Do your best to get people you personally know in the league. It's because actually amazing how a couple of new people that are super active can change the entire dynamics of a league. Yeah. By sure. sending out awful trade offers to you over and over again. Over and over. <laughs> Looking at you, Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, we love you. All right. YouTube question. Brandon wants to know, hey, fellas, with Jared Stidham, now the quarterback for the Patriots, do you believe that the value of Sony Michelle is above or below his ADP? Let's go to Al Borland for this one. Sony Michelle's <laughs> value? What do you think? Below. <laughs> okay. All right. Whenever we need a value question on Sony Michelle, we can count on Al to I, bring it down. Man, I don't know what to do with Sony Michelle because the, the the arguments can be just completely used against themselves where it's okay. Jared Stidham's the quarterback. They're going to have to rely on Sony Michelle more. <laughs> but if your quarterback stinks, the defense doesn't have to worry about the quarterback, and then can just stop Sony Michelle from doing anything. Uh, it is, Which has been proven, yes, possible. <laughs> yeah, we, we've we have seen that. It does Sony Michelle physically have it? Like, is it or did it already evaporate from his body? I, uh, and, and like I have him, let me let me find him. I think I have him in my like later twenties, and I've been in mock drafts. Yeah, I've I've been RB twenty eight right now in best ball. He's the RB thirty five. Okay, so I have him above that. It, but that's that's where it makes sense because I'll be in mock drafts and go. All right, Sony Michelle's by far my highest ranked running back. I'm still not going to draft him. I eight, think eight Sony, of sixteen games last year with eighteen or more carries. Yeah, I, I think Sony Michelle is a value he's a guy that if he can stay healthy he could have 270 carries this season now the touchdown upside is not there because nobody's projecting a prolific offense but I do think with Bill Belichick you know he's going to he's he's going to find a way to win games uh, and that's going to be defense and running the ball would you rather take a chance this comes from uh Judge Diamati he has a question for you Would you, sorry. <laughs> Would you rather take a chance on James White oh. or Sonny Michelle in a half or full? I would I would rather take – in a half PPR, I would take Sonny Michelle because I think Tom Brady and his quick decisions, his checkdowns for age, his timing throws, you know, that's all gone. I'm not going to put, you know, the, the pass-catching running back – into Jared Stidham's hands and say he's going to be just as good 
as he's always been. Sony Michelle's year is such a weird year. I'm looking mm-hmm. at these. He had these just at the beginning. Atrocious. I mean, his first game of the year, 15 carries for 14 yards, that point nine, right? Two weeks <laughs> later, nine carries for 11 right. yards, right? Then he goes four, you know, these games, five for eight. That's a whole game for Sonny Michelle. Then he ends the year. Do you know what he ended the year with? Oh, Nin- uh, 19 yeah. for 89, 21 for 96, 18 for 74. In a touch, damn. I mean, that those games are great. What is the truth? The truth is what you guys said. That it's it might he might end up a value, but predicting the offense is difficult. Well, and when you say a value, so this is something worth considering. I have him at running back twenty seven. He's being drafted at running back thirty five. You could say, okay, that is a value. If he finishes at running back twenty seven, as I'm projecting, and you draft him at thirty five, you can argue you had a value. I would argue it's a worthless pick. Because if you get the running back twenty seven and you used him through the year, that's that's not that's not doing much. You're going to have far more games that fail than succeed. Uh, you know, the running back 27 is meh at best. And yes, you barely eclipsed the ADP, but it's not like he was about, good enough to really help you win a championship. Yeah, I don't know. I it, it, To me, it's hard at running back because it's hard to find running backs at all. Like players like Adrian Peterson have had fantasy relevance over the last couple of years. You know, if you lean on Sony for the whole year, you got a problem. But if you're leaning on your 35th pick, you know, sure. the RB35, you got a problem to begin with. So, and we've talked about like, Jordan Howard is interesting in drafts because where he goes, you're like, okay, well, he seems like he's the last starting running back for a team that Miami is going to be better than they were last year. But will they actually be good enough that Jordan Howard can succeed for fantasy purposes? And looking at best ball ADP, it's, Sony Michelle, running back 36. Jordan Howard, running back 38. Yeah. So who yeah. would you rather have between so- Sony and Jordy? Ha- that is Jordy? Jordy. Jordan Howard. That is such a great, such a great name to bring up because when I look at Jordan Howard, uh, just, you know, mentally, I, I think he is a good value because he's a starting running back that's going to get work. And when I look at Sony, I'm like, ooh, yuck. I don't want anything <laughs> to do with him. I have Sony. Projected five spots ahead of Jordan Howard, or four spots ahead of Jordan Howard. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think I need to start looking maybe at Sony as if you are adding a depth piece, not someone you're going to rely on, but later in your draft as your bench option. Bye weeks, depth. Bye weeks, depth, emergency. Injury, he is a starting running back that's going to get a ton of volume. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be. It's not going to feel good to draft him. No, there's a. This is a group. I poor Jordan Howard. He gets brought up in every one of these examples too. Yeah, as I like know. volume running back. And that's probably the starter on a team that we're not sure about. I think Jordan Howard's probably better than Sony Michelle. Yes. I have him three spots higher than Sony. So I have Howard at thirty, right. Sony at thirty-three. But yeah, I, what do you believe about New England? What do you believe about Miami? I believe that New England's going to win. Who's going to be? Who's going to have a better record in the division, Miami or New England? New England, probably yeah. true. And and what's important for running backs a lot of the time? Yeah, winning ball games. So, all right, let's go to uh, another question from YouTube. Tommy, bonjour from Michigan. Come on, Tommy. Come on. <laughs> How long have we had this show? You might be in. People just want in on the bonjour, South man. Well, Canada, you can get but... in by moving uh, overseas. You're, you're close enough. Just go whatever, 100 miles north, and you're there. Is that how close Canada is to Michigan? Probably. Parts. Part. I mean, uh, at some Let's point, go to I our think it's resident Michigan expert, Brooks. Feet apart. Yes, through Detroit, you can very easily get to Canada. There, there you, you go. go. Jason's a So genius. go up there, send your email in. Thank you. And then you'll get the uh, bonjour. <laughs> yeah. Does it? But have you been up to Canada through Michigan, Brooks? A couple of times. Yeah. Does it cost you anything? I don't remember. Just a little time and effort here, yeah, Tommy. It, there's either a, a <laughs> creepy bridge or a creepy underground tunnel. Really? Under underwater. You just remember it was creepy, Canada. though, huh? You got a problem with bridges? You got a yeah. He's cr- and underwater crossing, tunnels, crossing yeah. a border, <laughs> creepy. Hmm, interesting. All right. Yeah. Underwater tunnels are weird. Those those do yeah. kind of freak me out what because the, you just uh, know like one after you saw the Stallone movie. No, that that doesn't daylight. help. No, that doesn't help. There are certain things that you don't want to have happen to you, and one of them for me is to be in a tunnel that is yep. leak, leaking water. Yeah. into it. Yeah, mm. that would not because there's be. no real way out of that. Mm-mm. No, 
Mm -mm. That's no. That's no good. <laughs> Jason's thinking guy, about it right it's now. Good, I'm it's thinking about it right out, now. Man. Yeah, dark. Let's get to uh, this Michigan question. What's the, uh, bonjour. bonjour. <laughs> he says bonjour. What would you do if you were caught in a tunnel? Well, no. <laughs> <laughs> he says, is Kenny Galladay a reliable wide receiver mm. one, and who oh. is more likely to star in the backfield, carry on or Swift? So smooth. Yes, I view him as a reliable wide receiver one. I have I have moved to where I view him as a reliable wide receiver one as well. And Swift is the more likely if one of these running backs is to break out. It's going to be the one they just invested in who is exceptionally talented versus the one that are, they've been frustrated with who hasn't been able to stay healthy. I was so hoping you'd follow that up with who is exceptionally talented. Because well, that would have been an appropriate thing. For, let me tell you. This is how profoundly uh, I believe in DeAndre Swift over Carry On. I have I have Swift up at thirty four, and I've got Carry On way down at thirty five. Woo! That's how I believe that backfield's going to play out. Mm. Which is a, uh, I guess, means I'm drafting Sony Michelle over either one. It would seem that way. Would you? Would you look at a board and you got to choose between Swift? It depends on my team. And Sony. Yeah, it would depend on my team. It would depend on whether I want that guy that I know has the role or the guy with the upside. And if I had enough yeah. running back depth, I'd probably take Swift just on the off chance I get something special. Swift's upside is much higher. He's much uh, he's he's swifter than old Sony. When you've Very got nice. a name like DeAndre Swift and you're a high drafted running back, I don't think it can go wrong, unless you go to the Lions. That's science. That's Okay. But yeah, Kenny Galladay is a reliable one to me. Yeah, I agree. I agree. All right, let's do one more Twitter question from Scott. Yo, yo, yo. Yo. Oh, yo, yo, yo. Would you uh, would love to hear your thoughts on how best to leverage the strength of schedule projections, or I'm sorry, predictions. Uh, should you target players with easy schedules or just use it to decide between players? Ding, ding, ding. How much weight should it have during your drafting process? Very little. Uh, very little weight. Um, because strength of schedules, it, we do, I think the best job you can do in crafting it. We're not just taking wins and losses or whole defenses. We, we break it down per position, exactly what they gave up per every position and then break that down on the schedule. But at the same time, they're notoriously inaccurate. What I look it's at a lot of turnover. That's all. Yeah. I mean, the, the, you know, this is, you know, people are wrong on players. Right when when there's just one person to decide upon, but whenever you're looking at a defense, there's eleven people on the field at all times, and the the turnovers is drastic. So I I look at the early season schedule that matters to me far more. Um, I don't look at playoff schedule. Um, I don't look at the the season schedule that much, but the early season I I give a little bit of weight to. Yeah, we I agree. I I look at early season. It can be used as a tiebreaker. It's important to me when I'm looking at my late round quarterback. Uh, I'm sorry, Daniel Jones it just doesn't look good for the beginning of the season for you. Uh, what's funny is in the draft season, I mean, that's what you look at it. And then in season, you're looking at the playoffs about, I don't know, halfway through or so the fantasy season, because then you actually have data that you can is actionable. I've been informed that the tunnel that Brooks is referencing in Michigan going into Canada is about 90 years old beneath the water. Oh, that's good. So that's why he said it was creepy. Mm. That seems like, I mean, that's... In the show how long that. is that? Is that pretty long? It's about 90 miles. So. Oh, man. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in, Footland. See you next time. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com and follow us on Twitter at the FFBallers.